Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. I'm Sean Kahn, one of the chief residents I'll be moderating today. We have um, three riveting cases uh, and uh, very interesting titles as well. Um, we have two of our chief residents presenting, Cole Swiston and Allie Simpson, as well as one of the pediatric neurology PGY3 residents, Mary Glenn View, presenting. Uh, we'll start with Cole Swiston. A fun fact about Cole, Cole is an avid fisherman, as most of us know. Uh, he recently bought a secondhand drift boat, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to take that out at some point this spring, and he'll, he'll have to row the rapids that have been a nemesis for us for the past three years. So, uh, Cole, come on up. Wow. Instead of shoveling my driveway, I've been shoveling said boat. Um, okay, so I have a couple of cases that I saw as a PGY3 on primary call um, that I'm titling 12 beers in a PB&J with a unifying diagnosis, but just kind of a challenging um, thing to see. So jumping right into it, I'm not going to give it away, but I'm just going to present both cases first. We're from an 11-year-old nonverbal boy with autism. Um, he presented, actually, he had three exams over the course of a week, one in clinic, one in the ER, and one formal EUA before ultimately it was discovered, um, the diagnosis. Parents were concerned that he had uh, progressive vision loss in both eyes over three to four months. He'd been bumping into walls, falling downstairs more often, and had difficulty with his iPad. That was uncommon for him. Um, and they noted some intermittent tearing and redness in both eyes. He has some atopic history, including eosinophilic esophagitis, allergies, but no known past ocular history up until this issue. Uh, he'd been, they'd been using an allergy eye drop for this tearing, and then he takes Zyrtec and Flonase for his allergies. Um, this was from my exam with him in the ER, him being nonverbal, you can only tell that he was intermittently fixed and following, no pupil issues and normal pressures. And then most notably on his uh, exam, he did have trace to one plus injection in both eyes with a keratinized appearance to superior conge and then scattered fluorescein uptake to the bulbar conjunctiva. Uh, the cornea had three plus diffuse punctate epithelial erosions in both eyes, which uh, were confluent in the right eye with an epi defect, although he did not have any concern for ulceration or infiltrate. Um, thinking about other etiologies, for vision loss in a nonverbal patient with autism, maybe self-harm behavior, there was no cataract, no retinal detachment, uh, though the view to the back of the eye was fairly hazy due to the cornea. And uh, these were pictures from the EUA. So you can see um, just with the ret cam photo there that that superior bulbar conge is quite wrinkled and kind of a very rough keratinized appearance with fluorescein uptake and then an inferior confluent epi defect there. Um, so that's Case one, not going to give it away. Similar but separate case was actually just a month later on primary call in the university emergency department, a 36-year-old male with eye pain, uh, both eyes but right worse than left for five days. He had the same symptoms a few months ago and was treated for an eye infection with some drops, no recent illness, no contact lens use, no trauma foreign body, and really no prior ocular history up until this issue. It takes no medications. Uh, we're able to get a vision on him. Uh, it was poor, 2,800 at the face in the right eye, 2,100 in the left, no improvement with pinhole, no pupillary issues, normal fields, extractor movements, and the normal IOP in both eyes. Um, you know, exam for him also had injection of both eyes, right worse than left, rough, variably staining, keratinized conjunctiva, um, bulbar conge. In his right eye uh, did have an inferior infiltrate and ulcer with an overlying epi defect with some thinning and diffuse stromal haze. Uh, no ulceration in the left eye yet, but did have rough appearing epithelium with diffuse punctate erosions. Um, in that ulcerated eye did have a underlying fibrinous reaction in the anterior chamber. And then the rest of exam was limited due to cornea, but normal. And so what I didn't mention for both of these was you know, the importance of social history and diet. So. Patient one, the boy with autism, his entire diet consists of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, uh, refuses to eat anything else. Patient two um, is very gaunt in appearance. He drinks 12 beers a day and eats primarily fast food. Um, and so I did not pick up on this in the first patient in the pediatric ED, uh, but with the EUA with Dr. Hoffman, 
almost immediately recognized that you know we should draw a serum vitamin A level, which was lower than the lower limit of the assay uh, for that patient. And then when I saw this second patient, I said, that looks pretty similar. Uh, and with the alcohol use, drew a vitamin A level, which was also reduced. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit today about vitamin A deficiency and the ocular manifestations of that, which is your ophthalmia. Um, as far as WHO estimates globally, it's the most common cause of blindness in children with over 250 million uh, children affected, and then almost 3 million with the ocular manifestations. Um, and as, as we probably know, that's most commonly due to malnutrition in developing countries. But in the US, we don't usually think of that as an etiology, as most of our foods are fortified with vitamin A, milk, margarine, cereals, some other uh, foods all have vitamin A in them. Um, and so in the US, it's usually a malabsorptive process or a GI tract disorder that will get you to this point. But I thought it was interesting that both these cases, you know, both these patients ate their way into or drank their way into vitamin A deficiency. Um, and so where do we get it? In the diet, you can have vitamin A in two forms. The preformed vitamin A, retinol and retinol esters come from animal products, primarily liver, fish, eggs, and then fortified dairy products, or um, from usually uh, plant, plant-based products, you can have pro-vitamin A carotenoids, alpha beta carotene and beta cryptoxanthin. Comes from leafy green vegetables, sweet potatoes are very high in vitamin A, tomatoes, fruits, and then some vegetable oils. Uh, importantly, in the U.S., 75% of our vitamin A is consumed in the, the preformed uh, version, and then up to 40% of that comes from enriched foods, so kind of highlighting uh, that um, importance in our diet. Uh, while globally, depending on diet, usually it's consumed uh, in the pro-vitamin A form, uh, and up to 100% of this preformed vitamin A can be absorbed in the duodenum, but only 10 to 30% of the uh, pro-vitamin A carotenoids. Hence, another reason why we see it less commonly in the U.S. So um, vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin absorbed in the duodenum. It's kind of oxidized to its uh, retinol and retinoic acid main active metabolites and then stored in the liver. It's transported throughout the body for its various needs on retinol binding protein, um, which requires zinc. So uh, if you have poor zinc, you can also have low vitamin A. So Whenever you're drawing a serum vitamin A, it's also good to draw a serum zinc. In the eye, uh, it serves two very different but important roles. Uh, for the ocular surface, the conjunct cornea, it's needed for maintenance and differentiated of stratified squamous epithelium. And the retina, it's very important with the visual cycle, as we know, it's needed for the creation and regeneration of rhodopsin, and that's preferentially in rods. And so as far as symptomatology, and we've all heard of night blindness from xerophthalmia. That's the most common presenting symptom in 71% of patients. Um, and then the other findings are ocular surface related. So conjunctival xerosis, bateau spots, and corneal xerosis are the next most common symptoms. Uh, these last four categories, according to WHO, are all just complications related to xerophthalmia. So corneal ulceration, keratomalacia, scarring, and the xerophthalmic fundus uh, is due to long-standing vitamin A deficiency. You can see some uh, posterior pole changes, which we'll show as well. The nyctalopia can be very subtle, especially in pediatric patients where you might have to you know, observe for a behavior change. And in this patient with autism, um, it's usually the earliest presenting symptom. And the ER changes actually may precede clinical symptoms. Um, and these ERG, ERG changes as well as the symptoms can resolve as early as 24 hours after initiation of treatment. Um, so this is a, a table from a recent paper with a patient with vitamin A deficiency. You can see the, the first four roads are all dark adapted ERGs. And then compared to the green uh, representative normal waveform, quite flat throughout, especially the oscillatory potentials. And then light adapted, not as affected. And then proceeding after treatment one week, one month, and two months, you can see uh, almost near normalization by, by one week. And the you know, surface changes actually thought that our patient had a pretty good uh, representation of that keratinized appearance to the conjunctiva and this conjunctival wrinkling and dullness. Uh, but toe spots will always be on boards. They're usually these triangular shaped white to yellow plaques. Uh, perilimbal in the intrapalpebral region, and they just represent a uh, buildup of keratinized debris over an area of divitalized conch. 
Um, corneal xerosis can be mild, as we saw with our patients with PEK, but can progress to cratomalacia, ulceration, secondary infection, and then scarring, which is going to be the main cause of irreversible vision loss for xerophthalmia. Uh, Long-standing low vitamin A can give you this xerophthalmic fundus, which uh, is represented by pale white and yellow seed-like spots along the vessels and in the periphery. These are also reversible changes that go away with treatment. Um, and so, like I mentioned, really the only way or what was thought to be the only way that you could get irreversible vision loss was corneal scarring. However, there is a uh, rare etiology related to longstanding vitamin A deficiency of optic neuropathy. From what I've been able to see, there's only been you know about 10 reported cases of this. Uh, and the pathophysiology is not fully understood, but we do know that vitamin A plays a role in bone growth and hematopoiesis. And they've looked in animal studies, I think it was cows, and they showed that vitamin A deficient cows had an increased osteoblast activity, including in the optic canal. So narrowing of the optic canal led to subsequent ischemic necrosis of the nerve and then uh, irreversible vision loss from optic neuropathy. And so in developed countries, malnutrition is not the most common risk factor, it's usually poor absorption from bariatric surgery or a short gut syndrome bowel resection, cystic fibrosis, as most of these patients commonly have pancreatic insufficiency and lead to poor fat soluble vitamin absorption, chronic diarrhea from inflammatory bowel disease or celiac, and then any sort of chronic liver disease where vitamin A is stored. I put alcohol use disorder on both sides of this. Um, as was illustrated with our patient, he in all likelihood had a component of alcoholic hepatitis, so was not storing vitamin A. And then, you know, because of the alcohol use, did not have a, a, a broad diet as well, so had poor intake. Um, and as for poor intake, our patient with autism fits on that side as well in the developmental delay category. And they've actually looked at this. Um, uh, autism is an unrecognized, relatively common cause of xerophthalmia in developed countries, and that's because of their propensity for a very narrow diet. Um, this is a table from a case series of a variety of autism patients with vitamin A deficiency, and this column is their, their diet, and not just part of their diet, this is their exclusive diet. So it's French fries, rice balls, bacon and blueberry muffins. So it doesn't sound terrible, but you're not going to get any vitamin A. Um, there was a group in Australia that looked at the most common causes of vitamin A deficiency in children, so a developed country, and while two of these celiac and cystic fibrosis were due to poor absorption, autism was actually in the top three uh, etiologies. Uh, as far as diagnosis, this is really a clinical diagnosis of special attention, like I mentioned, to the past medical and social history, looking at the risk factors uh, in resource-poor settings or in the U.S. you can treat empirically. Um, it's, it's fairly low risk, and especially in patients with really refractory dry eye, it, it may be a, a diagnosis to consider. Um, but you can also draw serology, like I mentioned, includes zinc levels, as that's needed for transport throughout the blood. And then supplemental studies like we saw ERG or dark adaptometry, and you can do uh, impression cytology of the conjunctiva, which will show you uh, representative pathologic changes that are not completely diagnostic, but suggestive of xerophthalmia. The WHO recommends um, these various um, repletion uh, recommendations for vitamin A deficiency, 200,000 international units at days one, two, and two weeks, so three doses. You cut that in half based on the patient's age all the way down to less than six months. If there's a concern for a malabsorptive process or any corneal involvement, it really should be IM. In fact, some patient or some hospitals will admit these patients for intramuscular repletion. Uh, in adults, this is the repletion recommendation here, and then support the corneal surface and treat the complications with antibiotic ointment or drops. Uh, promote, cornea, promote corneal healing with doxy or vitamin C, and do not use doxy in children. So our patients, um, the 36-year-old the with alcohol use disorder, uh, he had a right corneal ulcer, which puts him in WHO category X3A. He did have his vitamin A repleted. He had a culture, was started on fortified bank and Tobra drops, and then as well as vitamin C and doxy, um, was told to use erythromycin in the unulcerated eye. And then I talked to him for a long time. Um, 
you know, he had quite severe vision loss with risk of corneal scarring without using the drops in close follow-up. And uh, given the opportunity to potentially detox as well, we did offer him admission, but he ultimately felt like he could follow up and reliably use the drops. Uh, unfortunately, he did not. He forgot the drops in the emergency department, but he did follow up two days later and then three more times over the next two weeks. Vision did improve somewhat. Uh, the, the pain in the infiltrate did improve. The ulcer was consolidated, uh, but then he was ultimately asked, lost to follow up. So I don't know his eventual outcome. Uh, the patient with autism was category X2 because of the corneal involvement. He was referred to GI as well as his PCP for repletion. Uh, he was given large doses. I couldn't find the exact dose that he was given. And then was also um, given supplements to use long-term. Uh, his mom would crush them up and sprinkle them on his peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, which seemed to work. Uh, he had a full vitamin panel to look for other deficiencies, which only showed vitamin D uh, deficiency, no other issues. And then uh, within a month, his vitamin A level was low normal, but still normalized. He did end up undergoing a subsequent examiner anesthesia with photos, ERG, and a VAP with ophthalmology, which I did want to mention. Um, by that point, as expected, his ERG had normalized. But what we found was that the patient or the parents didn't really feel like his vision was improving at all despite treatment. And he had uh, reduced P100 amplitude and latency periods for, on his VEPs indicating a possible optic nerve issue. Uh, and during that EUA, he did have fundus photos. You can see both nerves are quite pale in both eyes. And then he didn't have a true RNFL OCT, but on these MAC OCTs, you can see that the retina kind of ends at the inner plexiform layer and there's very, very little retinal nerve fiber layer remaining. Um, so here's a representative normal of what we should be seeing. And so uh, he underwent a optic neuropathy workup with an MRI brain and then the other metabolic studies that I mentioned, but it was ultimately thought that this was one of those rare cases of irreversible vision loss from optic neuropathy related to xerophthalmia, which was kind of sad. And so kind of some take home points. This is not just a disease of developing countries. Um, you need a, a keen history to reveal the, the source of malabsorption or malnutrition in these patients and keep vitamin A deficiency on your differential ref refractory dry eye. Um, learn from your mistakes and your mentors, like I mentioned. When I saw the first patient in the ER, I had no idea what was going on. I, I knew he had very dry red eyes, but I did not think about vitamin A deficiency. It wasn't until I was with Dr. Hoffman in the OR during the EUA that it, it really clicked. And then when I saw the patient about a month later uh, with alcohol use disorder, I said, that's, that's gotta be vitamin A deficiency. Um, and while 12 years in a PB&J may get you through a primary call shift or a Wednesday night, if you're Catherine who, uh, you're not, you're not getting any vitamin A. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you guys. Dr. Olson. Good time just briefly, but this is one that can sneak up on you. And we've, we've, when it doesn't make sense. I had a cataract surgery patient that just the vision, he just kept complaining about things, even though his vision on the chart turned out that, that, that this was this, that he'd had a, he had a bowel absorption syndrome. But the worst I had was a cult where the guru thought that uh, the secret of life was daily LSD and only brown rice. And uh, a person died. So you know, this, is, this is a lethal disease, even though it was finally caught, uh, the person was already going into a general systemic failure. The corneas were essentially melted down to Decimase's membrane, and the person never recovered. So we, we, this is one you got to have in the back of your head because it can really fool you at times. Uh, just real quick. Um, yeah, mortality rate, uh, I, I think it's quoted between 5 and 25%. Uh, and, and obviously that's because if you're this, uh, at least in the developing world, and you're hospitalized for us for this, your nutrition status is so poor that the prognosis is quite poor. And, and that, you know, again, this being lethal, um, not so much due to the vitamin A deficiency itself, but just the overall uh, nutritional deficiency. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's needed for a lot of our immune function. So they can be pretty profoundly immunocompromised as well and get a variety of secondary systemic infections, which can also be lethal. Great, thank you. All right, thanks, Cole. Oh.
You don't hear anything. No. Strav says, great topic and review. After seeing an autistic patient in fellowship on a French fries diet for several years with severe optic atrophy and permanent vision loss, I've started screening every autistic patient and developmental delay patient for poor diet. I ask about multivitamin and suggest starting one if they're not doing it. Thanks for discussing. Thank you, Dr. Bagunta. All right, well, thanks, Cole. Um, up next, we have Ali Simpson, who's another one of our chief residents. She's going to be one of our cornea fellows next year. Ali's currently living her best life on elective rotation, which is a great rotation to be on the month before your wedding. Um, and she's expecting that Cole and I will be on our best behaviors at her wedding. Her case is not all that is pigmented. All right, I don't think I have any dietary recommendations, but we'll see where we go. Okay. So I'm going to start off with a case as well. It's a 20 year old female, no past medical history. Um, presenting to retina clinic with chronic floaters in the left eye. Visual acuity 2020 in the right eye, 2025 in the left, normal IOP, normal slit lamp exam in both eyes, and a normal fundus exam in the right. However, in the left, she kind of had this peripheral, darkly uh, pigmented lesion, um, pretty far peripheral. And you can see this Optos photo at the time that. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouth. That area inferiorly is not an artifact. That is actually uh, the tumor that we're talking about. <laughs> I don't want to put it in my mouth. <laughs> um, so the initial ultrasound in 2017 with Dr. Harry showed this large mushroomy tumor of the ciliary body. Um, and the uh, A scan at that time had showed this kind of really regular high reflective lesion that was about a centimeter in all dimensions. I won't quiz the residents because we just went over this last Friday with Dr. Harry, but this configuration is concerning for melanoma. I think they'll nod their heads and agree. Um, but that this A scan does not necessarily correlate. You'd expect something much lower reflectivity um, for melanoma. And so that allowed us to kind of expand the differential. Um, so a melanoma, is this a nevus, an adenoma of the uh, pigmented ciliary body epithelium, which is similar to chirpy, but of the ciliary body, medulloepithelioma, melanocytoma, hemangioma, not because of its appearance, but just because of how highly reflective it was on ultrasound, um, were part of the differential. It was recommended that she follow up in four months for repeat exam, and unfortunately, she was lost to follow up for three and a half years. Um, so she represented in 2021, she's 24 at this time, um, with progressive less, uh, left eye pain and vision loss um, that had been worsening over the past few months. At this point, she's hand motion eccentrically in the left eye. She's got an eye pressure of 42 in the left. She's got some mild conge injection, but no specific dilation of any vessels to be concerning for a feeder vessel. Mild corneal edema and a lot of posterior synechiae, lots of deposition on the anterior and posterior lens capsule. Unfortunately, at this point, there is no red reflex or view of the fundus in the left eye. She saw Dr. Harry again in 2021, where at this UVM, you can kind of see this large mass coming from the ciliary body. It's abutting the crystalline lens, but it's um, not fully captured here. Um, and actually, a standard B scan couldn't actually characterize the size of this thing either. So this is actually an immersion B scan ultrasound, which you can see this really large ciliary body lesion. At this point, it was about a centimeter and a half in all dimensions. Um, it maintained its high reflectivity on A scan, but there was some more vascularity at this, um, at this point in this exam. Um, so while the A scan continued to be inconsistent with melanoma, there was overwhelming con concern that this um, could be a melanoma. At this point, she's uh, demonstrated there's growth um, of the tumor. There's a lot of intraocular pigment deposition. Um, and while her workup systemically with imaging and lab work was reassuring, um, the ambiguity of this possibly being a malignant lesion was kind of unacceptable to her. You know, she had just gotten married. She was wanting to start a family. I think there was also some concern about her lack of following up for three and a half years um, that they didn't want to take any risks. So the patient was offered a nucleation and she uh, elected to proceed. 
Um, so then I got to see the path um, with Dr. Ramla. So it was nice to kind of have some continuity. But as you can see, this is a really large tumor. This is actually six fields of view com um, combined together to fully capture this uh, ciliary body mass. And it is impressively pigmented. Um, a little bit larger, um, a higher magnification. You can see, again, really um, densely pigmented cells. It's difficult to understand what's going on with the nuclei. But this um, um, image does show kind of the pseudocyst formation um, within the tumor. So there's no real epithelial lining, um, but there are cysts throughout. So this is a once bleached um, histologic section in which you can kind of be able to see some of the architecture. You have this really darkly pigmented cell still with abundant cytoplasm, just chock full of pigment. Um, you see some uh, macrophages kind of in the center part of the uh, specimen. Um, but again, it's still a little bit difficult to actually see what's going on with the nuclei. So this is a twice bleached section, and now you can really convince yourself that these are bland nuclei, small nucleoli, and low uh, nucleus to cytoplasm ratio in this specimen. And that was throughout the entire thing, um, which is really um, reassuring for benign lesion, and also helped us make the diagnosis of a ciliary body melanocytoma. So melanocytomas, you might also um, hear them be referred to as magnocellular nevi, or melanocytoma of the optic disc. They were first described around 1930, but the term melanocytoma started to be used more around 1965. It was coined by Zimmerman. And you'll see melanocytoma of the optic disc a lot in the literature. And the reason is it's most commonly located there. So these lesions can be located anywhere in the uveal tract, just like our case. They have this really common appearance, darkly pigmented. They can just involve the optic nerve, or they can kind of spread out and avoid the um, adjacent choroid and retina. They're rare. I tried so hard to find an incidence to report for you guys, um, but I couldn't find one. Just know that a lot of this data is coming from case reports and you know analyses where there's maybe 10 to 20 patients in total reported. These are usually uh, unilateral and they're slightly more common in women with about a 60 to 40 split. The mean age of diagnosis is 50 years, which you can imagine that's the same age that you're starting to worry about more of melanoma in your differential. Um, in one study, they found that about 8% had an, an association with ocular melanocytosis, but that there were no other um, ophthalmic diagnoses that predisposed someone to developing one of these. These are quite stagnant lesions. The growth is actually quite rare, only about 10 to 15%. In one study showed growth over several years. The thought that these may be congenital and that they are amelanotic and then gain their pigmentation throughout life, which is why you're diagnosing them at 50 years, but they don't seem to be growing after that. Um, I always find this surprising that there's not a lot of visual impact for these melanocytomas. Um, one study found about 75% have preserved vision um, and 26% experience at least mild vision loss in Snell and acuity. What is interesting is about 90% of them did have vis visual field changes. And this ran the gamut from, um, you know, an enlarged blind spot, nasal step to arcuates. What is visually impactful for these patients are kind of the secondary consequences. So retinal exudation, optic uh, disc edema or optic nerve ischemia, subretinal fluid, and then RVOs like I'm showing here, obviously do have an impact on the vision. There is not a lot of, um, sorry, uh, a malignant potential for these lesions, um, fortunately. So malignant transformation was reported in about one to 2% of cases. However, profound vision loss and growth of these lesions made one concern for malignant transformation. Pathologically, you're gonna expect your classic spindle-shaped melanoma cells among like the parenchyma of our oval melanocytoma cells. So these are typically diagnosed clinically. Fundus photography is really helpful in um, following them serially and getting measurements. Obviously visual fields to kind of gather if they're experiencing any visual field defects. Unfortunately, FA just kind of shows hypofluorescence throughout the whole angiogram. So it's not entirely helpful, though if you're looking for some of these other consequences, um, like you know, fluid or RVOs, it will show that. Similarly on OCT, again, if you get an OCT through one of these lesions, there's nothing specific, but they can be helpful for looking for ret retinal pathology. And then of course, ultrasound. Um, so, most melanocytomas are small, less than two millimeters, which certainly wasn't our issue in this case. But you can imagine trying to infer the internal reflectivity on ultrasound can be quite difficult with this, um, to the point that in the literature, you're going to find some reports that are going to re report that melanocytomas are high reflective, while others are going to say, say that they're low reflective. Um, 
I would say most of the reports do um, call them high reflective though, just like in our case. Prior to the use of ultrasound, lesion simulating melanoma, so this was all comers, nevi, um, uh, melanocytomas, medulla epitheliomas, et cetera, um, were responsible for about 20% of enucleations, but now enucleation specimens for melanocytomas are really quite rare. And just to review the ACE scan, um, so what was interesting, you know, these densely cellular lesions, those that have a very homogeneous structure like a melanoma, are going to have low internal reflectivity just because of the lack of interfaces. Whereas those with multiple interfaces, they're very heterogeneous. They have, you know, cysts or necrosis or pseudocysts are going to have high reflectivity. So things like a hemangioma um, would make me think of that. So the A scan on the top is one of a melanoma. Um, you can see it has uh, low reflective waves where I've just copied below the um, A scan of our lesion that's showing high reflectivity. So in our case, um, the microscopy showed multiple pseudocysts, which cause high reflectivity on A scan. And to our knowledge, this was the first correlation between the histopathology of lar a large melanocytoma with pseudocysts and high reflectivity on A scan. So we um, have now reported this and um, it's in a case report now. Um, my takeaways, not all that is pigmented is melanoma. Um, it's not lost on me, especially that I'm going into cornea, that this will probably be the only time that I see this tumor, but it was a good reminder to keep the differential broad. Uh, to share decision-making with patients is key. I think about what um, the outcome would have been if the diagnostic ambiguity of this lesion hadn't been shared with the patient um, and how ultrasound kind of helped introduce some of that ambiguity um, because to her, you know, she when the pathology came back benign, she was relieved that she didn't have um, a malignancy. You know, she had just gotten married. She could start having a family and she no longer had a blind, painful eye. But I could imagine if, you know, someone was expecting that this to be a melanoma and they were enucleated for a, ben a benign lesion, that the conversation would probably look a little bit different. Um, and then lastly, um, <laughs> Dr. Harry's parting words with us on Friday at our mole lecture was ultrasound is important. Um, and I feel like it was really displayed in this case as well. Um, these ultrasound is important for helping broaden the differential diagnosis, like in our case, it's helping us gain measurements. It's helping us even tell internally what these tumors may be doing. And I think it was really well demonstrated in this case. Those are my sources. Um, and thank you, Dr. Harry, Dr. Mamelis, and Dr. Gee, and of course the awesome um, PATH fellows who put together the photos for this case. I'm happy to take any questions. There used to be uh, ultrasound fellowships and people who subspecialize in ultrasound. It, it's another example of a kind of a dying subspecialty. Mm -hmm. We're lucky to have Dr. Harry and his expertise, but most places in the country, ultrasound Good, strong diagnostic ultrasound is just hopefully what maybe one group has taught the other. That expertise doesn't exist in a lot of the country anymore. Yeah. Um, so we, we learned that these are benign and relatively slow growing, like you said, only like 15 to 20%. Did you see anything in the literature that when they do grow, they're aggressive? Like in this case, 3.5 follow-up years, you can see that almost the entire eye is tumor. Like that's pretty impressive. Yeah. So even if I think diagnostically, if we would have known right off from the start that this was a melanocytoma, that interval growth during that three and a half years, I think we would have still been concerned for malignant transformation. And maybe she would have ended up with an enucleation or at least a biopsy um, to start, even if we had not considered uh, melanoma in the differential for sure. We have a comment from Dr. Mamelis, so we'll unmute him here. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. Sorry, I'm I'm moving really slow on crutches, and so I'm just sitting at my desk here. Um, this was interesting for a couple of reasons. First of all, the sheer size of this lesion and the melanocytomas that we usually see. Granted, they're very rare, so we don't usually see these are quite small or just medium sized. And so this one was very large. The other thing that was interesting about this was the fact that there was the high reflectivity on the ultrasound. 
And that was because of the cysts that were in there. And, and usually when you see these, the reflectivity is low, which then makes it difficult to discern these from a malignant melanoma. And that's where the, the difficulty comes up in trying to diagnose these is to discern the, the melanocytoma, which is benign, from a melanoma, which, which is potentially aggressive. Now, there have been rare cases reported where a true melanocytoma has then turned into a malignant melanoma. And in fact, Dave Apple reported one from here. It was right after I had left my fellowship with David and he reported one here, but um, these are extremely rare that these go on into melanomas. And so, you know, this one was very large. It had high reflectivity and it, it's less commonly seen arising from the ciliary body than it is from the optic nerve um, head, which is where you most commonly see these. But this is only the second ciliary body melanocytoma I've seen in, in 35 years. So very, very rare lesion. And Nicely presented, it really made a very nice case report. Thanks, Dr. Mamlis. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you, Ali. All right, up next we have Mary Glenn Veu. She is, again, a pediatric neurology PGY3 resident. Uh, Mary Glenn, fun fact, she is from Montana, and her favorite activity there is kayaking. Uh, she's going to be talking about myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, or MOG, optic neuritis. All right, everyone, thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to be sharing a case that was recently on our inpatient uh, neurology service. I'm on my adult neuro year, so this is an adult case of MOG optic neuritis. So the patient is a healthy 39-year-old female who came in with a week of painful eye movements and progressive bilateral vision loss. And the first symptom that she'd noticed was that pain with eye movement, didn't think much of it initially. And then she started to develop a central scotoma that um, spread outward. She described her vision as walking into a dim room after being outside on a sunny day. She saw a local ophthalmologist early on who didn't really notice anything significant on her visual acuity, visual fields, or her fundoscopic exam. And she had an MRI brain without contrast done as an outpatient, which was unremarkable at the time. But over the course of that week, her vision continued to decline and she then had complete loss of her color vision. She described everything as seeming washed out and she could only make out vague shapes. So really in terms of her past medical history, there was nothing too significant. She hadn't had any surgeries, trauma or other opto problems, no similar episodes in the past no significant neurologic or autoimmune history. And the only medication that she took was phentermine for weight loss. And then no significant travel or exposure history, notably no preceding viruses or um, vaccinations that she reported. On her exam, as you can see, her visual acuity was significantly impaired in both eyes. She did have a RAPD on the right and her visual fields were globally affected. Um, her color vision was also severely reduced and she was noted to have grade two disc edema bilaterally. Her neuro exam, including cranial nerves, her motor exam, sensory exam, and coordination were all normal. And she did note um, full range of motion, but pain with extraocular movement. So we admitted her and obtained MRI brain face and orbits with and without contrast. And it did show diffuse enlargement and abnormal enhancement of her bilateral optic nerves consistent with bilateral optic neuritis. And notably greater than 50% of the optic nerves were enhanced. Um, and her MRI C and T spine were normal. So no other lesions seen on her. So in terms of her diagnosis, um, she 
was atypical in terms of her optic neuritis because she had bilateral involvement. But the classic triad of typical or demyelinating optic neuritis involves this variable vision loss, periocular pain, worship eye movement, and color blindness. So in thinking of your differential and what to work up, um, demyelination is obviously of high concern, as well as other antibody mediated processes such as NMO, spectrum disorder, MOG, um, inflammatory autoimmune diseases such as sarcoid, SLE, et cetera, infectious causes, post-infectious or post-vaccination, and then it can just be idiopathic as well. So given our high index of suspicion for um, an inflammatory or autoimmune process in her, given her age, her absence of other um, infectious systemic signs or symptoms, and really no risk factors in her medical history, we started empiric treatment um, of optic neuritis with one gram per day of IV methylprednisone, and we chose to do five days, followed by a six-week oral prednisone taper in her while we awaited further workup. So the lab workup we got on her when she was inpatient, we did CSF studies and her opening pressure, cell counts, protein glucose bands were all negative, including flow and cytology. Her inflammatory markers um, and other autoimmune labs such as ANCA, ENA, ANA were all unremarkable as well. Her serum aquaporin-4 antibody resulted negative and while she was admitted, we did get the results of her DNS demyelinating panel and she was MOG antibody positive. She had a relatively low titer, um, but we did consider that to be positive. Um, we also sent a Mayo encephalopathy autoimmune and perineoplastic panel that eventually did result negative as well. So we diagnosed her with MOG optic neuritis. And one of the most impressive things to me was to see her dramatic improvement. So on day of discharge, her vision was 2040 bilaterally. She no longer had an APD, normal visual fields, and her color vision was still impacted, but it was significantly improved. Um, so MOG optic neuritis, um, in terms of MOG antibody disease, optic neuritis is one of the most common clinical manifestations and presentations of this disease. You often see the pain precede the vision loss. Um, and the vision, the vision loss is typically more severe than in other optic neuritis disorders such as NMO or MS. And it typically involves more of the optic nerve so as in her case, we saw greater than 50% of the optic nerve affected. You often more commonly see optic disc edema as well than in other causes of optic neuritis. It is more commonly bilateral than in other causes of optic neuritis. So in 50%, it's bilateral. Um, it's more likely to be a monophasic course, and, but it does still recur in about 50% of patients. And the best news is that the prognosis is good. So typically most of their lesions resolve over time as opposed to MS lesions or NMO lesions. Um, you're less likely to have CSF bands and the treatment is IV steroids, which typically patients respond well to. In the duration of treatment, it doesn't seem like there's a very clear consensus to this, but generally three to five days of IV steroids followed by a six to 12 week oral taper is generally what's recommended. In refractory cases, plasma exchange can be considered, IVIG can be considered, um, and the length of this course varies as well. So as I said, one of the cool things about this case was being able to have an answer, the same hospital admission, and be able to provide some prognostication for the patient, which rarely happens in neurology. Um, so her five day stay, we were able to say you have MOG and um, optic neuritis, and that was very satisfying for me. And I think gave her some peace of mind too, when she's wondering, could this be NMO? Am I more likely to have recurrent lesions, spinal cord lesions, et cetera? So I think it's awesome that in the past 10 years, we've started to identify these discrete antibodies implicated in optic neuritis. And they can give us some guidance and give patients some guidance about what to expect. 
So obviously she'll follow up with um, neuro-ophthalmology and autoimmune neurology as an outpatient and continue with um, occupational therapy until her vision is totally recovered. And that's my case. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, <clears throat> you think about, I mean, the, the underlying problem is, is metabolic, and obviously, th then there's a, a strong autoimmune component associated with that, but what are some of the other, I mean, it can't just be optic neuritis. What other presenting symptoms do these people have, or is this really just mainly optic neuritis? With MOG, yeah. antibody disease? Well, in kids, we more commonly see ADEM, so this diffuse demyelination pattern that usually also is monophasic. Um, it can present with spinal cord involvement alone, so it can be really highly variable. So, but, so it can be a, a fairly profound problem associated yes. with, with the uh, nervous system elsewhere, but, but yeah. this is the most common. And, and why do we think that it, it tends to be monophasic and, and not recurrent? That's a really good question. I tried to look into that too, and it seems like if people stay seropositive, they're more likely to have relapses, um, but that's really the only thing I could see that's a risk factor for relapse versus just having a monophasic course. So still a bit of a mystery then. I think so, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, that great case, um, and it is very gratifying to see these people uh, I think that the um, the wonderful thing is that they tend um, not to have uh, other neurologic conditions like multiple sclerosis, and they're not really at risk of becoming paralyzed like neuromyelitis optica, which is just great. Uh, and their visual recovery tends to be really terrific and um, often not nearly as much um, optic nerve tissue loss like on, on uh, OCT as a lot of other optic neuritis is. Um, but... Um, uh, the spectrum of presentation is extremely broad, as Mary Glenn was saying, uh, and, and in kids, they can present like basically in a coma because their entire brain is inflamed, and yet they recover. There can be very profound cerebellar and brainstem inflammatory conditions. Um, uh, pretty much anywhere that there's white matter can, can get inflamed. Um, one of the interesting things that has come out with MOG optic neuritis is cry on chronic relapsing inflammatory optic neuropathy, which has always just been a, well, I don't know, you just keep getting optic neuritis, I don't know why. But as these people keep coming back for follow-up, we test them for MOG, and it turns out, I'd say at least half, maybe two thirds of those folks actually have MOG, and now we have a test for it. And now we have some sort of guidance as to where, how to treat them. Um, that has been hugely gratifying. And, and then also slightly buried was that, 50% of these people do recur. So relapsing optic neuritis is not uncommon, probably more common than multiple sclerosis. I mean, you don't see people with regular multiple sclerosis having relapsing optic neuritis again and again and again, whereas somebody with MOG, they can 50% of the time. Uh, and then finally, just a little uh, antibody deal. So, um, you know, Mayo is the one, they're the ones who developed this antibody test, which was terrific. Um, you know, they just have, you know, everybody's serum in the entire world who's ever had anything wrong with them. So they are constantly, you know, searching for, for stuff, useful stuff. And it's been so great. Um, but when a, when a test gets licensed, then, um, other places can do it. So ARUP can test for MOG. So we just learned on Friday at the WINO meeting, Western Intermountain Neurologic Organization meeting, um, there were a couple of folks uh, talking about MOG. And of course, it turns out that there is a difference. So there is a cell-based assay, and turns out that the dead cell-based assay, which is what ARUP does, is not as sensitive as the live cell-based assay that Mayo does. So if you're kind of thinking about the diagnosis and you've got this equivocal level, it's enough to make a diagnosis, but if you really want to know, you still have to go to Mayo. Great case, Mary Glenn. <laughs> <laughs>